Sunday, October 14th, 2018, at 9.08 in the morning, I gave birth to our son, Hart Zachary. I was just 20 weeks, 9 hours into 20 weeks, and that 9 hours made all the difference in the world on how I was treated in our hospital. Prior to 20 weeks, they treat you as a miscarriage. You're just simply in the emergency room and you deliver your baby and that's it. That nine hours made all the difference because I was in labor and delivery and delivered my baby with a team of kind nurses and my husband by my side and a compassionate OB who delivered our son. Eight weeks into my pregnancy, I started spotting. I have two kids and I had very normal pregnancies with nothing at all interesting that happened in them. Very normal. I didn't even have morning sickness. So at eight weeks when I started to spot, I got really concerned quick. And I braced myself for a miscarriage. I scoured the internet for all kinds of information about what spotting meant that early in pregnancy. I was always comforted by the fact that I never had any cramping um, I didn't have any other miscarriage symptoms. And so I eventually saw my midwife for the first appointment and she was a bit concerned about the spotting. <clears throat> I went for an early ultrasound and it took a week to get the results back because it was over a weekend and then there was a holiday Monday and the results took three to four days anyways and it took that long to learn that my baby was viable he was alive and happy and life was good but throughout my pregnancy the bleeding got heavier and at various points I started passing clots and throughout the pregnancy I went to the ER four different times each time the bleeding was extremely significant. I went on October 2nd. I had gushed a lot of blood. I think you would call it a hemorrhage. And I immediately went into my midwife's office. It was after hours and she found the heartbeat right away and so we were so comforted. And I said all along, as long as the baby's okay, like that's all I really care about, I'll be fine. And she was, had a friendship with the OB on call that night. His name was Dr. Morris. And rather than just going and sitting in the emergency room and having my blood tested and having a bedside ultrasound, which is all that they can do for you, um, he came and did an internal exam. And I was so happy just to be in the care of an OB, someone who knew what he was doing as far as like babies were concerned. And <clears throat> he didn't see anything wrong. Um, my cervix was fine, it was closed, I wasn't in labor. The ultrasound showed that the baby was doing really good, his heartbeat was strong, and the OB was so confused. He just shook his head and he said, I cannot explain why you are bleeding. Because prior to that, I'd had several ultrasounds. I think it was maybe five at that point. And they were looking for certain things. Um, and those certain things that they were looking for as far as different types of hemorrhages and things, they were not finding. They found nothing. And so it was determined that I would be transferred into the care of an OB. Um, I. Uh, would have needed to deliver my son via c-section so that was always going to be there would be an OB on my team anyways because of that but they needed to move me into his care much sooner initially my appointment was set 
for the end of the month but after that October 2nd incident I was able to get in to see him just this past week. So the events of last week you can see some of them on my channel because I was participating in Vlogtober and so I was doing a lot of vlogging and sharing my day to day. So last Monday was Canadian Thanksgiving and we celebrated with our families. Um, we had a big dinner and it was fun and exciting and we were full of anticipation because the following day, Tuesday, I would go for my 18 to 20 week ultrasound and we would find out what we were having. We were so excited and everyone thought we were having a girl except my son Colt who's four. He just was convinced we were having a boy. He wanted a little brother so bad. And so that Tuesday I went for the ultrasound and when she told me it was a boy I was shocked and uh, was so excited. I went from there to Carter's and I picked out a few outfits and um, was going to reveal to our kids and to the family what we were having that night and I shared that gender reveal here on my channel. And so many of you just shared in that joy with us. We were really excited. And so on Wednesday, I went to see the OB. And he was armed with a pile of paperwork from, at that point, three emergency room visits. All of my information from my midwives. Um, all of the ultrasound reports except the one that I had had the day before. They were supposed to fax it to him, but they didn't. And so he poured over all of the paperwork. Um, he heard the heartbeat right away. I was measuring great, like everything seemed good. And he is an older doctor um, with just a lot of wisdom under his belt. And he was confused and he said that in some very rare cases, some women just bleed through pregnancy and that um, if I bleed heavier than a period, I needed to go to the emergency room, which is kind of the protocol all along. And he said, after Sunday, here's the number for labor and delivery. You can call them and you can see them if you start to have heavy bleeding again. And so with that information, I left and I was, you know, feeling good, like, okay. Um, and that afternoon, my um, midwife called just to see how the appointment went. I had officially been transferred into the care of the OB, but my midwives were going to follow up with, um, with postpartum care. And they just, you know, were still kind of checking in just to see how I was and kind of wanted to see me one or two times over the course of my pregnancy, but they wouldn't be really doing anything clinical. It was more just for any questions that I would have. And so one of my midwives called and she um, was asking how the appointment was and then she mentioned the ultrasound report. And she said that there was a slight separation of the placenta. And I don't know if I would have been given different counsel from the OB had he known that, but I was already taking things very, very easy. Um, my mother-in-law came often to just help with life. My daughter took out the garbage. Um, she mainly took care of our dogs. Like she just did a lot of the heavy lifting for us. She's a strong little girl and really willing and capable of helping and loves to help. And so my husband, had been away um, working. He'd been gone almost the entire year up until this point, about eight hours away working. And he had come home for Canadian Thanksgiving. Um, and that Thursday, he went back to his work. Um, the job was just finishing up, and so he was going to work Thursday and Friday gather up all his belongings, and then basically move back home. We were excited for that. Um, we are just really anxious to have him home, and my mother-in-law had accompanied me to all of my ER visits because um, I was advised I shouldn't drive and stuff, and with my husband gone, it was, you know, she was next in line to help, and she was always a willing heart. 
And so that Thursday, the day that my husband left, I woke up at three in the morning and I hemorrhaged. I passed a ton of clots and it was devastating. It was awful scene. Um, so I knew I was going to have to go back to the emergency room and I was devastated. And I share with you a little bit of that footage in, a, in my last video because I knew I would just be sitting in the emergency room waiting for an ultrasound um, and hoping that I had a compassionate doctor who knew what he was doing when it came to babies. And that trip was actually our longest trip yet because they wanted me to have a formal ultrasound and so I had to wait for the ultrasound to open at 8 in the morning and so she did a long ultrasound. I didn't even know at that point if the baby was still with me. Um, but the fact that she was taking such a long time, I had a feeling that it was probably he was probably still there. And so I sat in the emergency room waiting area, waiting for the report from the ultrasound. And finally, the doctor came and he said that the baby was doing good, the heartbeat was strong. But he said, your amniotic fluid is a little bit lower than where it should be at this point. And I was shocked because that hadn't come up from the Tuesday report. This was just two days later. Um, so we left at like 9.30 in the morning, came home, and just laid low, relaxed, um, and talked to my husband, and he determined that he would not stay and work. He would come home just in case, um, he just really felt bad that his mom had, to, was, you know, taking care of so much life, so... He packed up all his things and started to come home that Friday. Or was it Thursday? I don't remember. <laughs> it's all a bit of a blur. Saturday at 5 a.m. I woke up to a gushing of water. And my water had broke. And I really just had hoped that maybe I just, it was my bladder. It was just wishful thinking at that point. And it was Saturday at 5 in the morning. And it wasn't yet Sunday. And I tearfully called labor and delivery and said, Please, can you take me? I will turn 20 weeks in just a few hours. And they wouldn't. And I was devastated because I did not want to go sit in the ER and potentially lose my baby. My hope was that I would lay low and things would be okay. I wasn't having any cramping. Um, and so my mother-in-law came and was with us all day. My husband was home when this all happened, so I guess he came home on Friday. Um, I drank a ton of fluid. I laid in bed all day. And I discovered through Google that what had happened was I had a pre-premature rupture of the membranes, a PPROM, PPROM. And I was so encouraged because there were so many women who went on to deliver babies. At 20 weeks, your baby is not viable for life. And it's usually between 23 and 24 weeks that you have a 30% chance of survival. At 28 weeks, it's 90%. And my hope was that I would follow this regime of laying in bed, drinking tons of water, and taking this specific vitamin regime, and that I could keep my little guy in, and if at worst case, have a micro preemie. But at least he'd be here. And so I laid in bed all day, felt really good. Um, and my plan was at midnight, a little bit after, I would call labor and delivery and I would go in to get assessed because at that point I would officially be 20 weeks. And I called and at one point she did try and say, are you sure you have your dates right? And I said, I know I have my dates right. I saw the doctor on Wednesday and he confirmed it. He gave me your number and um, so they had me come in. So 
my husband and I went into labor and delivery. We got there around 1 in the morning. They did an assessment and she first did like the Doppler, the nurse did, them heartbeat instantly. And I was so thankful. And then the OB came in and she did an internal exam and found that I was one centimeter dilated and um, said that they wanted to have a formal ultrasound done in the morning to come back at 8. And so we were discouraged but still hopeful because I had read so much about these women who did the pee proms <clears throat> and how they just went on to deliver. And um, so we went home, we got home at 3 in the morning. Um, I laid down and went to sleep and at 5 in the morning, just 24 hours later, I woke up and I started to feel some low cramping. And I hoped I was wrong. And as I laid in bed and I It wasn't necessarily timing things, but I was noticing that there was a bit of a pattern. So I got up and I used the bathroom. And I laid back down and I hoped it was just nerves. And not even 30 seconds later I felt something come out. I rushed into the bathroom and the cord had come out. I knew it wasn't good. I ran into the living room where my mother-in-law was sleeping on the couch and I woke her up and I said, I've passed the cord. We need to go to the hospital. And she got up and I ran in and told my husband and he got up right away and we sped into the hospital. We live about half an hour away. I had called labor and delivery before we left and told them what happened and they said to come in right away. So we did. And when we got there, she hadn't even cleaned up the bed where I had last been because she knew I was coming back and I just had left. She was shocked to see me. She was such a kind nurse, so kind. So the OB came in again and she did an assessment and she said that I was in labor and there was nothing they could do. So they got a room set up for me. And we went in the room and I got changed into a hospital gown. And she started to say that she needed to ask us a bunch of questions and she was so apologetic and she said, now I'm gonna need to let you know that I'm gonna have to ask you questions about what funeral home you wanna use. And it was in that moment that it just became devastatingly real. I'd never thought of funeral homes. But that's where we were at. And so they had talked about pain management and um, I just assumed I would get like an epidural or something. I didn't want to feel anything. <laughs> um, not that I was afraid of, of natural childbirth like I tried with my daughter. I just was did not want to feel the cruelty of feeling labor and not have a child, living child, be a result of it. I just wanted to be numb. But the contractions weren't that strong at all at that point, so I had no idea how long I'd be in labor, so I opted just to wait a bit. And it got settled in the hospital bed. And, um, we just waited. Sometime after eight, um, 
one of the pastors from our church came. He's a grandpa and he's always so friendly and happy and joking and sweet and kind and he came to the room and um, we just looked so sad. And later his wife told me that when he came he said it was like his daughter was lying there. And he came and he gave me a kiss on the forehead. <laughs> he prayed with us. And it was such a beautiful prayer. And he invited the Lord into the room with us. And I don't know what happened at church that day. I think I gave him permission to tell what was happening so that they could pray for us. And he left. Just after he left, the contraction started really hard. And I kept trying to buzz for the nurse so that they could come and give me something stronger. Again, like I just didn't know how long I would be in labor, but they were getting so intense and so painful. And at this point, my mother-in-law and father-in-law came and they were there and they were praying over us and crying with us. And I'm buzzing for the nurse and finally my mother-in-law, she ended up getting them. They gave me a shot of morphine and gravel and I thought that would take the edge, it was supposed to take the edge off of the contractions, only they just got worse. And finally, they went back and asked if it would be time that I could get the epidural. And she came in and she had been time in the contractions and they were very close together and very long. And she said, I'm going to have the doctor assess you first. And it was a different OB at this point and a new nurse. And she, the nurse was a grandma and she was so kind. And the OB actually happened to be Dr. Morris, the same doctor who had seen me in the emergency room and did the exam and he I was so thankful it was him because he was so kind and compassionate and he looked so sad so he came in and he checked me and he said the baby was right there it was time to felt him move um, when I was laying in the hospital bed so I know he'd been alive. At some point he passed away so he wasn't suffering and I was so thankful for that because I think I just would have broke even harder. so gently and cleaned him. And at first I thought I wouldn't want to see him. I wanted the picture of him in my mind to be of who I imagined he would be, a chubby, cute little baby, a rambunctious little boy, a strong, tall son. But I was his mummy. And I couldn't let him not be loved on by me. I could not snuggle him. I could not hold him. And so I had asked that they would take him and clean him up. I delivered the placenta.
They brought him to me. He was so tiny. He was wrapped in two little blankets. One was a wedding dress. <clears throat> and then the other one was it was it was a blanket made from a wedding dress and it was beautiful. It was white and he was had a little bow tied and then there was like a um a blue flannel and it looked so Canadian and he was wrapped in that, tied with a little bow. And someone had knit a tiny little hat for him and it fit around his head but it stuck up kind of like a gnome hat it was so cute and they gave him to me he had his brother's nose his daddy's broad shoulders and his sister's perfect little lips had long fingers, tiny little fingernails, and he was so warm. <sighs> I got to love him, and hold him, and kiss him, and his daddy got to hold him, and love him, and kiss him, and his grandpa, and his grandpa. with him as long as I wanted. And even now I wish I'd stayed with him longer. But my mother-in-law said that it probably never would have been enough. She's right. They could have never held him long enough. It's so hard to know we'll never hold him. My arms felt so very empty without him. The rest of the day was hard. It was a bit of a blur. Eventually, uh, I was able to go home. The hospital gave us a beautiful hand-painted keepsake box and inside was his outfit. The little blankets he wore and his hat. They took his footprints and did this embossing of them and inside was a little card with like how much he weighed and how long he was. He was nine inches long and he weighed eight ounces. We named him, we named him Hart Zachary, H-A-R-T. And the reason we named him Heart was because we used to play this game and it was my daughter's game and she would say, we would, she would pick a letter from the alphabet and she would say, okay, it's going to be a boy's name and it starts with D and we would all have to pick a D name for a boy and then she'd pick a different letter and it would be for a girl. And we'd play this all the time trying to come up with names. And um, my son always insisted, always insisted that if it was a girl, her name was going to be Love. And if it was a boy, his name would be Heart. There was no swaying him at all. And he was really adamant that no matter what, any time we played this game, it was always, if it's a girl, it's Heart. If, it, if it's a girl, it's Love. If it's a boy, it's Heart. And so... We hadn't yet come up with a boy name that we agreed on. We had just found out he was a boy six days before. And um, at one point my husband had said he liked the name Zachary. I liked it too. And um, so we decided to name him Hart Zachary. That was our little boy. And my husband had to make the call to have him 
cremated and we were very thankful that there was a funeral home in our area that actually did it for free. The hospital took pictures of him and sent him to an organization called Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep. Um, one of the nurses would create like a, a collage of and montage of like his pictures and make something really beautiful of it. And I can't wait to get those back. Today, I dared ventured out. I went to home since. I was just trying to feel a little bit of normalcy in a small way because nothing about this has felt normal. I'm so in the throes of grief. It's unbelievable. But I thought I'd try and do my makeup a bit today and my hair. And just try and do something for myself. And I went to Home Sense, just walked around. I had a really hard time. Much harder than I thought it would be. I almost broke down once. And as I was waiting for my husband to pick me up, at the front of the store there was a display and it was, there was a really tall shelf and I was looking out the doors waiting for him and I just happened to glance over my shoulder at this tall shelf and on it was a tiny box and I went over and I picked it up and it was so perfect. It was a heavy marble rectangular box like stone type marble and it had a lid and it was so perfect and I knew that would be where we would put his ashes and on the top of the box it had written love in gold it wasn't vinyl but it was some kind of substance that was easily scratched off and I love that it said love on it because heart and love. But it just didn't go with the box and it didn't go with my decor. Um, and I wanted his box to be something that we could easily display in our home. And it wouldn't be... It would just be so perfect. And this box was so perfect. And so we've this little box for when he comes home, which will be either end of this week or early next week. We plan to have a service for him, a memorial service. We hadn't planned on that either, but we both felt like it was going to be right, my husband and I. And while I'm not excited to plan it, <laughs> I am looking forward to pouring my love into this service that will honor our child. He was so wanted. Telling my kids was so hard. Shane had actually come home first from the hospital. Um, my mother-in-law had stayed with me because he needed to to go and he was having a really hard time and I was just kind of sleeping and it just made sense for him to go and I was kind of glad that he'd be able to just go and he was going to tell our daughter. I was I couldn't. And he was going to go and tell her. cried so much. And so when I got home, I came into my room and I showed her the box. And my mother-in-law was in here with us and we were going through the box and Aubrey was crying and I was crying and Grandma was crying. And Colt was being silly. He was trying to play like hide and seek and he was trying to make everybody laugh and then he finally said, why is everybody crying? And I looked at him and I said, Heart died. And he screamed, No, no, no. 
And he laid on the bed and hid under a blanket, screaming and crying, no, no, no. My husband came and we laid with him. My mother-in-law took Aubrey and they went outside with the dogs because it was just so heartbreaking. And he was screaming. He said, I want him back. And I said, we do too. I just let him cry and grieve. The day after, on Monday, October 15th, <clears throat> is Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Day. And you light a candle from 7 to 8 to remember all the babies that were born of a miscarriage or stillbirth or who died shortly after birth. And there was an organization in our area who has four bereaved parents who have lost a child through stillborn or whatever. And they put on a service for the wave of light. And I'd participated in lighting a candle for friends who've lost their babies before. And I never thought that I would be one. And my husband and the kids and my mother-in-law and I all went and we lit a candle for heart. And we I just cried through most of the service. And it felt really good to be with other parents and people who knew that loss because it hurt so bad. We're only three days away from losing our son. And it feels like a lifetime ago, and it feels like a lifetime to come. And I've read so much, and I've had a huge outpouring of love and support from all over the world. Hundreds and hundreds of people have been praying for us and reaching out, and it's meant everything. I knew I needed to film this video so I could let you guys know what happened. I know many of you follow me on Instagram so you already know our grief. But I wanted to put it here so you could know. Our world will never ever be the same. He'll always be a part of us. My friend Kate talked about, Kate's a year or two older than me, and she talked about how when she was seven years old, her dad came home and told them that their baby brother was born, but not alive. And Kate told me about her grief at being seven years old and about how she felt. But she said that even now, they include him in everything that they do. They sign his name to cards. When they take a family photo, he's represented by a yellow rose. And on his birthday, they send the mom a dozen yellow roses. And even all these years later, he's a part of their family still. And that's what I want. My mom said the most comforting thing. She said, oh Mandy, she said, he won't be forgotten. She said, when people ask how many grandkids I have, she said, I'll always tell them I have three granddaughters and five grandsons. And she said, when we see my nephews playing in the dirt, or they're swapping hunting stories. She said, we'll think of Hart because he would have been right there too. And I guess the biggest thing that I've come to learn, I've heard it 
had said before, but I didn't know until I was in this space, is that you want people to say your child's name months, weeks, years from now. I want people to say, I thought of heart today. Or to tell me that heart loves me. Or just mention his name. He'll always be a part of me. Always. I miss mom. I have three. Faith says that one day I'll see him again when I get to heaven. In the meantime, I have a lifetime of missing him and longing for him. If you think of us, please pray for us. Pray for us weeks from now, years from now, months from now. I know that we'll have a difficult time in February when we would be finally getting ready for him to be born. I know I'll have a tough time on March 3rd, his due date. I know Mother's Day will be difficult. And I know that October 14th always be a hard day. <sighs> so the biggest thing that you could ever do for myself or anyone who's lost a child is to remember them and speak about them. And if they cross your mind, let them know. I will, um, I'd like to share with you guys some footage from the memorial service when we have it. And we were talking about going away to Pennsylvania to visit my family and if we do something special there for heart. I'd like to film it and share it with you guys because these vlogs that I did up until this past Thursday, they will mean everything to me. I look at that Thursday, that vlog I did, and I was like in a green jacket. I was so happy and so excited and so full of excitement for what was to come. That was the last moment of happiness in my world. And someday I'll be at that point again, but for now I'm in the throes of grief. Grief is ugly. And the only way through, the only way to the other side is through. And so it's going to be a long, painful process. If you want to keep up with me um, and our story, you can always find me on Instagram. That's where I post the most. But for now, it's lots of tears, a little bit of laughter. We are laughing. There's a bit of, I found a bit of normalcy today in cleaning my bathroom. I know that sounds so silly, but cleaning my bathroom, I was like, okay. We 
I still have a lot of hard things to walk through. But one day we'll get there. Thank you guys for always being there for us and your um, continued support of my family. I just also want to say, if you get to the end of this video, um, <clears throat> I know that sometimes these videos can be trolled. I would just ask that if someone does troll this video, that you would just mark their comment as abuse and don't engage. Um, thank you guys for everything, and um, thank you for sharing in this journey with us and being a part of my story. I'm so thankful for you guys. I thank you for your prayers and for loving us through this, for sharing in our joy and sharing in our grief. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.